Uh, it is a great pleasure to be joined by Peggy Hogan, AKA Huali. She is a recording artist and performer based in Montreal, Canada. And she is also a label manager of uh, Next Door Records and Outside Music. How are you today, Huali? Thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. How are you? Yeah, I am delighted to have you too. <laughs> so uh, I should like to begin by a, addressing your uh, Instagram bio, which you introduced yourself as, quote, half militant, half Chinese, and half rapper. So let's get, yeah. let's get into all three of that. So the first one, half militant. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tongue in cheek kind of byline that I use. Um, but I, I guess I came up with this kind of at the peak of um, the post Trayvon Martin right. uh, kind of first Black Lives Matter movement in the States. And um, just thinking about this time of kind of racial awakening for people of color mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, me and all of my friends were just really kind of cognizant of systemic racism in a way that I think was never so palpable before that. And it was just a conversation we were having all the time and we were feeling like real frustration around it and feeling also quite powerless and, um, and impotent, you know? And I think as a, like a group of artists basically in Montreal, Canada, um, it's not like things were so bad here it was really that kind of covert microaggression kind of stuff that we were dealing with all the time in, in terms of the way that we interacted with the institutions that fund us or whatever else. So I think that came from the spirit of like, okay, well, I'm going to use art as my means of protest. Mm -hmm. And um, while that feels so meaningful, there's also that kind of self-deprecation around like, you know, I'm not a Black Panther over here. Like... <laughs> You that's, know, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But uh, I wonder if you find, you know, these black militants from, you know, the past, either your Hugh, your Huey Newton or your Bobby Seale or your, was it uh, Eldridge Cleaver, you know, do, do you find some resonance with their messaging and their activities in any way, shape or form? I think the thing that I find most interesting about that kind of 60s, 70s civil rights movement in the States has more to do with my position as an Asian American in the sense that that was a time where um, young Black and Asian people had a very strong sense of solidarity and a unity toward um, a common cause. The, the level of solidarity that took place during the civil rights movements um, what with organizations like the Black Panthers and um, the AAPI uh, were just much more cognizant. And I think that's something that I, I do romanticize and I do kind of like have nostalgic wonder for where I feel like, especially kind of post Rodney King, there, there became to be these kind of splinters in our communities and the the um, the more that the model minority myth becomes kind of rarefied and solidified, uh, the more that our community splinter, and that's something I find to be a real shame. And I think when I kind of have this nostalgic view of 60s, 70s civil rights movements, I'm often thinking about that really profound level of solidarity. I see. Um, just uh, to be clear, you know, um, I've, I've interviewed a previous uh, guest who was also an Asian American artist. She's living in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, I've, I've received, uh, you know, warnings from her manager and her label saying that because we discuss political matters in the show, I'm not to upload the, the episode. So I just want to be sure that, you know, whatever we are discussing is, is not affecting your... Uh, musical trajectory or, you know, your job in any way, shape or form. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I run my label and I'm my own manager. So. All right. So that's good. <laughs> We're all that's good. good. <laughs> all right. Still, um, one thing I find very fascinating about the Black Lives Matter movement, and I've had certain oppositions to it, is that it has become a worldwide phenomenon, not just limited in the U.S., but um, it is not the case that, you know, the the idea of um, Black men and police officers and those issues are uniquely localized in the United States. But nevertheless, you see Canadians and British people protesting in the name of Black Lives Matter. And you see even you know, countries which are majority Black uh, protesting uh, in the name of the movement. So I wonder if you can you know, uh, give us a sense of why that is the case. Uh, I mean, listen, I can't speak um, as a as an expert globally, but what I can say is that in Canada, we face many of the same issues that racialized folks in the United States face, and police brutality is a huge issue in Canada. Um, racial profiling is, is something that happens in a very overt and profound way in Canada. Um, in major cities like Toronto and Montreal, where there's a large black population, it's it's very overt. And I would say it, it tends to be even actually more overt in the center of the country, um, in provinces like Manitoba and also Ontario, like Thunder Bay is, is a great example of a community that um, the police have extreme bias toward the indigenous population there. And um, so I think, the general ideals of Black Lives Matter can be easily mapped on to other communities. And I think when it comes to the idea of police reform and um, thinking about the way that oppression works on a systemic level, that is coherent regardless of even like the demographic makeup of a place. If there's inequality, I think, the, the root values of the Black Lives Matter movement can speak to the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that's a good segue into the second clause of your bio, which is half Chinese. And uh, yeah, so tell us about your background as uh, an Asian Canadian. Yes, well, I'm a, I'm a CBC, a Canadian born Chinese. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I grew up, I'm very much half Chinese. My father was uh, a white Canadian, like as, as white Canadian as they come <laughs> in the sense that we, uh, you know, it's like, people are like, but what kind of white? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, there's a little Irish, Scottish, British in there. There might be some other stuff. <laughs> um, there's, there's some people that came up from the States, who knows, you know, <laughs> so um yeah, I would say there's when you get um, when you get immigrant groups and colonizers that are multi generation white Canadian, that connection to culture can become kind of obscure. Whereas my dad met my mom in Wuhan, China, which is her hometown, oh. and uh, they moved to Canada together in 1989. So Obviously, I think the cultural influence of being Chinese and having a Chinese mother who had grown up during the Cultural Revolution um, and was very Chinese in, in ideals, in presentation, in her cultural practices, that became something that was much more culturally coherent to me as a child. Um, also, my dad didn't have a a terribly strong relationship with the rest of his family. Whereas like my mom's family was coming to visit us. My grandmother helped raise me. So I grew up speaking Mandarin and um, eating Chinese and dressing Chinese and uh, really had this like interesting kind of cultural bubble almost that I lived in before going to school where it was like radically different you know? Yeah. And I think that that's something that um, definitely is, is part of my bio because I'm proud of being mixed and I'm proud of having navigated those spaces. But 
that experience of kind of straddling both worlds certainly is something that I think um, is is a huge component of my artwork. Yeah, I understand. Um, of course, I'm very fascinated by the stories in which um, um, Asians who are living in North America and the West in general tell and the experiences that they have had. And it seems to me that the general picture that's being painted is that um, Asians in North America are, for the most part, positively looked upon by, I guess, the dominant culture. But nevertheless, they are invisible. And they are not represented in the their media, the, the popular media of that time and the popular culture. Obviously, you're doing, you know, you're making your effort to combat that. And of course, you've also mentioned that concept known as the model minority myth, which uh, I first encountered it, I think, in an Amy Chua book. Uh, yeah, could you tell us what that means and, you know, whether or not you were personally affected by it? Uh, wow. Okay. So that's a very big question. The model minority myth in, um, I would say the shortest summation to me is, uh, a concept that was put forth in the 1970s. I think the first time it occurs is in an article in, in time magazine, uh, essentially formulating especially East Asians as uh, the quote unquote model minority in the sense that they're able to assimilate to Western ideals in the certain way of like academic achievement and um, deference to the white overlord. And, you know, like uh, the, there's this idea of like, oh, this is the ideal immigrant in our society because they're able to um, assimilate to our, our values and also not fight, you know, like there's, I, and I think this is like the, to me, the formulation of the model minority myth is the end of the like profound kind of solidarity movements that I talk about in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's part of the rub for me is that, um, it, it recapitulates this idea of like what Asian American identity should look like and, and deference in the face of white supremacy, I think is, is a huge component of um, what makes someone a model minority. Um, beyond that, I think what also troubles me about it is that it creates an inaccurate picture of what Asian identity is in the West in the sense that it is very uh, flattening. It creates the sense that like, okay, well, you know, Asians, they're all doctors or chemists or pharmacists and they don't need any assistance and they're doing their own thing. Um, and they don't experience racism. I think that's the other thing that it, it, it implies like, okay, well, they're okay as a demographic group. Um, the reality being that there's certainly no Asian American monolith, like, you know, I'm Chinese, you're Vietnamese uh, of descent. Like there are like some similarities, like we have some of the same cultural practices. There are also huge differences. We speak different languages. We have different histories, you know, different histories of colonization and, and the way that the West entered our countries even, you know? So um, it really flattens those, uh, that really valuable kind of, cultural um, diversity that that exists within Asian American identity, let's say. Uh, and it also flattens different experiences of inequality and access within Asian Americans as a group, you know, like the Hmong people really don't have nearly as much access to resources as like, let's say, a third or fourth generation Chinese or Japanese American. It's, it's just profoundly different. And when we start to um, create these monolithic kind of labels over um, very, very different groups of people with different histories, that can only be harmful. Yeah, I, I certainly understand. I'm, you know, I'm of course opposed to the myth of model minority because again, it paints 
Asians as a group of people who think the same way and who believe in the same ideals. I, I know that I know that many Asians who are very conservative and there are Asians who are very progressive. There are those who have an easier time assimilating into Western culture and there are those who, you know, have a more difficult time. And so, you know, and the fact that, um, you know, people of uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, um, Japanese, North and South Korean and Filipino and Taiwanese are all lumped together in this one weird label, um, Asian, is uh, utterly simplistic. And, you know, I hope that, you know, in, a, in the near future, you know, Western popular media and popular lingo alter that. Yeah. Certainly. I mean, I think even just, I don't think representation is the, is the be all end all. I think it's really just the beginning of the conversation, but um, yeah. it is, it is interesting that like, even with uh, like a squid games, you know, that people, some people are actually like watching this with subtitles on and they're listening to Korean language yeah. and cool. like that's, it's becoming like, okay, this sounds different than mm -hmm. Japanese and like, you yeah. know, just those little subtle things in terms of like, okay, like th there is like, like different contexts here and different histories, you know, the language stuff is huge. Um, so often I tell people about um, the idea that in Chinese language, the written language is is one thing called Chinese. Mm -hmm. And then there are kind of the two large branch dialects, right? Like Mandarin and Cantonese. But we all share the same written language. And why? Well, because we have a language that has hundreds of dialects. And, you know, even within the branches of Mandarin and Cantonese dialects, not everyone understands each other. So when you're watching television, you need some sort of unifying thing. And it can't be phonetic, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and that blows people's mind in the West, but it's like, well, this is yeah. actually like a, a perfectly engineered system to help, you know, two plus billion people communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I should like to uh, jump uh, segue into your um, the third clause half wrapper, but uh, yes. I should like to, uh, you know, add to your point by saying, I think, I think prejudice has a, it's you know, a component within a racially and culturally diverse society, and it shall be. And, you know, in times of prosperity, economically and socially, the we are able to successfully push back the prejudice that, frankly, transcends races. But in times of crises, like what we are experiencing since 2020, then the level of prejudice are overt and are intense. You know, I, I, I identify myself as a conservative politically, but I have been increasingly frustrated at the levels of which uh, my, you know, cohorts at the right um, resorts to naked prejudice, like racism. You know, I hear mm -hmm. a prominent conservative commentator in America call the virus the China virus, for example, and mm -hmm. despite agreeing with him, probably. 90% of the, the time, I still think that that is not someone that I should emulate in my political thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, uh, when we talk about times of crisis, any time, especially in the West, there is a time of reckoning for especially white folks the the tendency will be to go to protectionist attitudes nationalist mm -hmm. attitudes um and it and it really kind of shows like what pro proliferates under the surface you know where like there's no threat to to nationhood or personhood it's like okay well we can all kumbaya get along mm -hmm. uh as soon as some sort of discomfort presents itself these um what we like to think of as like old school ideas really start to bubble to the surface. And, and certainly we saw this with the pandemic and the terrible treatment that, that um, people who presented as East Asian got, you know, mm -hmm. um, suddenly we're all Chinese and we're all carriers of the virus <laughs> and we're a threat, you know, like um, I wouldn't say that East Asians have been the, victims of violence at the hands of white people in such a covert way over the last like 
30 plus years in North America. And all of a sudden it's something that's happening everywhere. Like it's like Chinatowns across North America are like, we have to protect our elders and make sure that they're safe. And there's people getting pushed into subways. There's, you know, the, the story of the kid that got cut from his ear to his eye. And, um, there was a stabbing in, in Montreal, like one of the safest places in North America, you know? So I think that these anxieties really do proliferate those, those old school nationalist beliefs around like, how do we protect ourselves? And I I guess what I would wish for, um, what I would wish for the right, as I do for the left is that we're able to understand like, what is the common goal here? Like, you know, I think when the, when the right reaches toward racism, they forget that there are people like you who have shared beliefs and you have those beliefs for a reason. And if, if there could be that meeting of like, okay, well, what, what is it that motivates me to be, to have conservative values and where can we meet here? That would hopefully help them understand like, okay, my way of living and my belief system is not nearly as much under attack as I believe. And that not every like different looking face I see is, is a symbol of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's a real shame. And certainly like, I, I know that there are plenty of conservative folks in, in like every POC circle that exists. Um, it's, it's something that, came up when I was working with Chinatown Working Group in Montreal trying to, you know, save Chinatown from gentrification and and predatory um, development where it was like, well, now we're working with the business association and the business association is like old school conservative Vietnamese folks. And it's Mm. like, we're a bunch of like (laughs) young riffraff coming in and we're like, well, what is our common goal here? And I think that that's so much more profound oftentimes than just leaning back on like, well, this is how I identify politically. And, you know, that's where the conversation ends. It's like, well, our common goal is to save Chinatown. There are certain things that that we're not going to budge on. Like we don't want more police presence. So, you know, like how do we negotiate that? But, you know, if, if the business association doesn't want to budge on certain ideals, we negotiate those things for the common good. Um, so I, I, I guess this is a long way of saying, like, I wish that when we, when we work in political groups, we need to understand, like, what is our goal here? And uh, we need to let go of, like, the biases that we have outside of that goal. Yeah. You know, I, this uh, podcast also serves as uh, my vehicle to discuss politics with, you know, some of my some of the thinkers whom I find interesting, both American and Canadian. Um, so, but one thing I find about political discussions is that um, you, there is a lot of negotiations that's going on, whether you are talking to someone who shares your views and someone who doesn't, because though there are those who share your views are can be very radicalized in their solutions to the problem. And those who do not share your views actually have uh, plenty of brilliant ideas on how the world works and what should be done. But I should like to uh, transition into music because, uh, Mm. well, again, I should like to address that half rapper phrase. Um, I understand that of all the musical art forms exist out there, I guess, outside of punk rock, hip hop is the most political or politically inclined form of music. And, but while I I have my ideas on how much politics, to what extent should politics enter the realm of the arts, I I still find it, you know, admirable that, you know, um, some of the greatest rappers can blend their artistry with their politics and make it into an artistic masterwork. So my question now to you is, um, do you have any favorite hip hop artists of that sort? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I think as a, as a historically black art form, 
it is really hard to divorce political struggle from um, let's say pure artistic cr creation. And, and honestly, I, I think this may be a place where, where we diverge, but I don't know that I believe in any purely artistic expression. I think art always happens in a social context and um, that social and cultural context gives art meaning. And that means that it is almost inherently political, no matter uh, whether or not it is um, intended to be political. There's, there's a reflection of always what's happening in society when you look at a piece of artwork. So um, that being said, I think a lot of my favorite rappers have been extremely overtly political. Like um, one of the groups that really profoundly influenced me as a kid uh, was Dickable Planets. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think uh, there's obviously some very overt political content there but it's also um, very metaphorical and abstract and, and um, aesthetically beautiful. And the way that really challenging issues are brought forward in that group, um, they're brought forward in a way that's both challenging and also very aesthetically rich. And I think that that's something that um, I definitely really try to accomplish with my work as well. Um, Lauren Hill and the Fugees were also a huge influence on me as kids and as, as a kid. And, uh, you know, I think they're also quite overtly political. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like I think about like Biggie Smalls, also mm -hmm. a huge influence on, on me as a kid less overtly political than these other groups of course being like much more of a top 40 rapper but um you can't help but notice like the way that he is making coherent the plight of his people and his experience growing up in new york as a young black man and, and what that means to kind of like overcome that so i think that yes within hip-hop there are always shades of the political weaved in there whether it be very overt and very like the top of the intention or just like here's my story and and by virtue of um by virtue of being people of color our stories are always politicized in the west because we don't get to have that neutral blanket of whiteness there's always that sense of like you know you're an outsider or like you're positioned as something slightly different and so in offering that story there is something um there's something that is a little meatier, I think. Yeah, I would say that in the ex the experience of every minority in any country, not just in the West, is that um, unwittingly you become the representation of quote unquote your people. For example, you know, I've spent four years as a Vietnamese in Canada, and even though I've experienced virtually no discrimination, at least of the overt kind, um, there are people who see me as, I guess, the representative of, you know, the Vietnamese uh, peoples and, and uh, any politician of uh, a minority, whether it's Black or Hispanic or whatnot, has to, has that invisible pressure of being that way. And and I think in a free and equal society, that should not be the case, but unfortunately it is. And it's another thing that you have to push back against. Certainly, I, I always say, um, I, I often use this term racialization and people have asked me like, what do you mean specifically by that? Um, the idea there being like racialized people, so non-white people, um, they are quote unquote racialized because they're not individualized in the same mm -hmm. way that white folks in the West get to be individuals. And in, it, individualism, of course, is one of the founding principles of Western society, like the idea that you individual expression, like choosing your own path, whatever else. Um, the, the rub is that racialized people it's very challenging to break past your racial identity to be seen as an individual. You are always in some way part of the monolith of 
your racial group. And and I think this is exactly what we're both talking about is this idea of like, it's a dehumanizing act to not get to have access to individual freedom and expression. Yeah, um, of course. Um, now I'm, I'm a student of uh, philosophy, especially of the political kind. And I know that the notion of individualism, yeah, of course, is Western, but it's also a very modern one. And that is, mm -hmm. and it is a, I think it's a good thing because um, it is, uh, it was conceptualized in a time of rampant tribalism, really, people do not identify themselves as an individual, they, they see themselves as part of um, their religion, their family origin, and their nation state. And so mm -hmm. the invention, the creation of individualism, actually bolsters our ability to, uh, you know, for of self-actualization. And it, I think, um, and this is my view, the racialization of peoples like you and me and other non-white folks is, is uh, to bolster individualism, to uh, compel people to see us as individuals and not members of our race and class. Yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I, I often see racialization as um, a, a means to deny our individualism, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, of course, like, understanding one's racial identity and identifying with, with one's history is very important and, and is a component in self-definition. But if the majority, if the dominant culture doesn't um, give you the benefit of being seen as an individual before seeing you as a racialized individual, uh, as, a, as part of a racial group, I should say, that's where the tension starts to arise for me. So um, yeah, I, I, I think I see racialization as a means to maintain a dominant culture well i guess um yeah my view bit differs on that but uh, i should like to address the fact that of course you are a woman of asian descent in the field of hip-hop music and which is you know aside from being historically black has also been historically dominated overwhelmingly by males by men mm -hmm. and I think that has uh, contributed to some of the overt misogyny as well as racism in the hip hop world. Um, as much as recently, you see the great hip hop artist Kanye West uh, spouting just age old anti Semitic slurs. And this is a long history of people like Ice Cube and uh, Jay Electronica, you know, adopting anti Semitic positions and. And there is also anti-Asian uh, prejudice too. And I remember a tribe called Quest, they do that. And, you know, being uh, an Asian person who enjoys hip hop music, I, you know, when I notice these things, I am obviously abhorred, but, you know, uh, but I still very much appreciate their artistic gifts. And so um, I wonder uh, how, how do you navigate that, you know, uh, balance between the magnificent poetry of hip hop and some of the uglier elements of you know its creators. Certainly, I mean, I, I think this is a, a deeply complex question, and and the examples that you give are um, are very diverse. So when it comes to to people like Ice Cube and Jay Electronica, um, you have to understand like the history of Nation of Islam, and. Yeah. Um, and and that the, there is like an anti-Semitic kind of um, line that works through the history of Nation of Islam, um, which is like a whole other can of worms. And certainly, I I'm not here to defend defend anti-Semitism in any in, in any way, um, but just to say that the cultural context there, where those beliefs arise from, is very different than I think a Kanye today in 2022 saying some wild ass shit. 
So, um, I think, I think those are distinct experiences, not to say that any of it is, um, condonable, um, but that there is, there's just a different context. Um, so when we're looking at context and artistic expression, which is something that I'm very passionate about as a former musicologist was uh, all I ever wanted to do was look at societal context for music. Um, when we look at a tribe called West, uh, tri tribe called Quest, <laughs> um, that that skit in question came at a time just after, yeah, Rodney King, um, Rodney King, and so it it does bring to light a real conflict happening between specifically Korean American and a. Uh, Black American communities in Los Angeles that was then bringing to light issues in lower class neighborhoods across the nation. Um, again, that context, I think, makes that piece meaningful now that we can look at it and be like, oh, that makes me feel uncomfortable. What is this about? And like, what is historically happening in this moment where? Um, these two these two racialized groups are like really butting heads and, and what is the tension there so uh, certainly again like it, it's not that i'm like woohoo like let's like let's say derogatory things about the the asian community but what is driving that attitude w what is happening culturally that's what i find fascinating um so those are those bookmarks when it comes to hip hop as a dominantly masculine art form. Yeah. This is something that I can talk about for hours and I wrote a thesis about this. So <laughs> this is this is a topic I'm passionate about. Um for one, I don't see hip hop as any more masculine male dominated than any other genre in music music is incredibly male dominated it's something that i came up against as a classical pianist it's something i came up with against as a jazz musician i work in the indie rock industry at the label that i work at it's something that i come across there it is absolutely there's no genre of music that is not male dominated and it is finally changing now but i wouldn't say in any way that hip hop is more male dominated than any genre, except in the sense that when hip hop became commercialized, heavily commercialized in the late eighties and early nineties, I would say like NWA being kind of like the turning point of like, this is now a very commercial music and is uh, very much overtaking rock music in the charts and is the, the dominant money-making genre. Um, at this time, there was a real shift from gender representation in hip hop to creating black masculinity as the, the dominant soul voice of what this genre looks like. And the uh, like icon figure of the genre became black masculinity, which is frankly incredibly, um, is an incredibly inaccurate understanding of what was happening in hip hop historically. Like the very first full length rap record ever made was by uh, a group called the Funky Four Plus One. I think it came out in, in 1969. Ugh, I don't remember exactly, don't quote me on that, but um, the lead singer in that group or the lead rapper, I should say, was a woman. First full length rap record to ever come out of the South Bronx. Um, so women have definitely been part of hip hop culture from the, the very beginning. There have always been B-girls. There have always been women MCs. There have always been women um, doing graffiti writing. Like the, 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 we are like an erased component of what has created this genre. Um, and it was really that turn in the late 80s, early 90s, when the genre became commercialized, that um, there was this very specific kind of understanding of like, okay, if you're a rapper, you have to be a black man. Yeah. And of course, Eminem uh, challenged that, uh, you know, even though, you know, his views on women are also pretty questionable. Um, um, I, I should like to, uh, you know, uh, 
dive more into the, the issue of, I guess, uh, representation of women in hip, hip hop, because of course, as recently, there are famous names in hip hop who are women, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, and of course, Nicki Minaj. Uh, but uh, this is a very funny thing. I There was this time where Ben Shapiro, who was this uh, famous uh, conservative commentator, he mm-hmm. was riffing on the WAP WAP video. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was I, it was rather ridiculous to see, you know, someone <laughs> of his stature, uh, you know, uh, diving into some pretty petty culture war stuff. But he does address the issue of if you wish to be a woman in hip hop, you have to present yourself as this overtly sexualized character because in the realm of hip hop, um, women are often overtly sexualized so uh, I wonder if um, you know speaking as a half rapper and full hip-hop artist um, how do you how do you navigate the I guess the expectation of sexualization in that particular genre of music I mean I'm a I'm a very sex positive person so it's not it's not something I I feel like, oh, I've got it. I need to be sexualized in order. Like it's, I don't feel like I'm misrepresenting myself in that way. At the same time, um, this it's a double-edged sword in the sense that yes, like at, at a certain level of top 40 success f- from the time of, um, I would say like the little Kim Foxy Brown era, there has been an archetype of like, what does it mean to be a woman in hip hop? And, and that woman is like a caricature of oftentimes sexuality in a way that is um, extremely overt and, and um, rattling to, to certain segments of the, the dominant culture. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it's complex. And, and I think it is what we see now with Megan Thee Stallion, Cardi B, and Nicki Minaj is still a remnant of the formulation of kind of the Foxy Brown, Little Kim, like that we get one woman at a time and she's always this kind of woman. Yeah. Um, what I find more exciting than that stuff when it comes to representations of femininity in hip hop um is the more underground stuff like cupcake is in many ways also like extremely overtly sexual actually but in a way that is doesn't cater to the male gaze at all is like very queer um and i think that's really exciting there's people like carrie foe who are i would say actually not like hypersexual in any way like she's really just talking about her own experiences as a woman um so I think that stuff is is really fascinating. And that harkens back to a time, again, pre kind of the hyper commercialization of hip hop and pre black masculinity being the, the be all end all of like what hip hop is as an icon, let's say, um, where we had a lot of women in hip hop. We had MC Light, we had Queen Latifah, we had um, uh Bahamadia, you know, like there was just so much more. There was Ladybug and Diggable Planets. Like there was just a, a hugely diverse actually representation of what womanhood looked like in the genre. Again, before that that kind of turning point with um, NWA post hyper commercialization of the genre. So um, what it says to me now that there are finally not one, but three women that we can kind of look to is like, okay, they're the kind of the top of the charts, Mm -hmm. um, is that eventually that idea of like, this is what you must look and sound like to be a woman in hip hop. And this is the subject matter that you must deal with. Eventually that's going to kind of break apart. And I think as much as Megan Thee Stallion can be hypersexual in her lyrics, she's also a great advocate of self and talks about a lot of really deep stuff and um, talks about self-empowerment and self-actualization in a really profound way, even in the sense of like the idea that she's talking about, like celebrating herself getting through college, 
<laughs> and like, you know, like putting herself through this and the importance of like maintaining that education while like also blowing up huge as an artist. Like why, why are you staying in college? Well, it's important to me to have this piece of paper and have this legitimacy despite, you know, like I've got all the money, I've got all the cash I need or whatever, you know? Um, so I think a figure like Megan Thee Stallion is really interesting because it's like, she's taking what she needs of like, let's say that kind of cape of success and is slowly subverting it. And I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with her career. And I'm also excited to see the, the doors that she opens for um, other forms of femininity coming to the, the top 40 charts. Like I'm, I'm not an artist that aspires to be there, you know? So it's not, I'm never in my career have I been like, let me break down doors for everyone in the top 40. Like I'm totally content being a weirdo, half everything. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. I didn't know that, you know, that interest in uh, higher education that Megan possesses, you know, higher education. And, uh, you know, it's certainly a very interesting part of her repertoire. Although uh, the less we say about her appearance in the she Hook so show, the better. I find that my favorite rapper, uh, my favorite female rapper is actually Lauren Hill, because um, of all the of all the women rapper who have uh, gotten chart success, she is the perhaps the only one who has expressed um, femininity and womanhood in <clears throat> the most complex of forms. I mean, in her debut album and so far her only album, um, there's that single doo-wop, which is incredibly feisty and edgy, but there's also the song X Factor, which is a tender breakup song. And it is um, it's quite a tragedy that Miss Lauren Hill never really followed up with that, that part of her, you know, that work, her work as well as her musical work. And I wonder if, uh, you know, how, you know, you obviously mentioned that you find Lauren Hill inspiring, so, Tell us more about how she has inspired you. Uh, I consider Lauren Hill to be part of my origin story. Um, one of the first rap records I ever heard in my life was Miseducation of Lauren Hill. And um, I think I heard that record maybe when I was like eight or nine years old for the first time. And it's, you know, it starts with like a classroom like it starts with kids' voices. Yeah. Know? And um, hearing kind of like the, the voices of children, it's like, you're like, okay, I'm part of the story. Like, this is for me. And then like the beat drops in. And it's like, then it's like, okay, whoa, I'm being transported into something that like, I've been told, especially as like a young Chinese classical pianist like that world is absolutely not for me you know <laughs> like um so I think it's this moment where it it really was so profound to hear like the voices of kids and girls talking about like what does it mean to be a girl and what are the expected expectations uh, that society places on girls already like that the the stakes already start to be so high from such a young age um, and to immediately be transfor transported into hip hop music from there. Um, that's one of the most pr profound things I think about the hip hop tradition for me is that there is that profound sense of like, I can find myself in here. And um, because it's so personal and authenticity is such an important part of the art form, um, we get to share in, in a human experience that is, um, is full of adversity and full of, you know, a very colorful, like granular difference. And the more that people are able to share their own narratives, the more that other people are able to identify that uh, with that. So uh, I think that's always like my feeling of like, when I think about that record, it's always that sense of like, wow, hip hop has this transformative ability to bring me out of like, I'm in like this little white girl's like bedroom in a suburb of Victoria and we're listening to this record. And like, now I'm being transported to this classroom 
and I'm surrounded by kids of color and like there's this like shared experience and we can really grasp onto these ideas that affect us all um and like how amazing is that especially as like you know I, I grew up in a very white neighborhood and um I I didn't always feel that like my experience was reflected in the experiences of the, the kids around me so um yeah I that record just it was like a hug the first time I heard it I was like yes there are people that go through the same stuff that I do. Um, and it may not be exactly the same, but that there's that sense of like, we're united by some sort of unspoken understanding. And, and that's really profound and beautiful. Um, you know, I think that that was ultimately what Lauren Hill did for me most. And from there, uh, I was able to like discover other stuff like diggable planets. Like I cannot, I cannot state enough like what an important group that is to me and you know like I didn't know that Ladybug was in that group like the surprise of like okay I'm gonna check out this like you know golden era group that everyone talks about and then like hearing Ladybug's voice and being mm -hmm. like whoa she's actually the sickest rapper in this group you know <laughs> and like wow like women really are killing it and and feeling that you can feel so palpably in those records like the level of respect the other MCs have for Ladybug like there's such a beautiful balance between Butterfly and Ladybug's voices and like you can tell that Butterfly like admires her lyrical prowess you know and so it it's like these narratives that run counter to this kind of like sweeping narrative of like you know women suffer in this genre where it's like actually no like we're the architects and like, there is actually a lot of respect for us if you can find those those places where it is still allowed to exist. It's not necessarily allowed to exist in commercialized hip hop, but that they're there. And yeah, like groups like Diggable Planets and the Fugees, like that uplift of like, actually we're gonna center the woman's voice in this group um, is really profound to me. Yeah. Yeah, and I do find that you know, in the realm of hip hop is, um, the individual is very much highly emphasized. And of course you mentioned authenticity. It is obviously the ability the, to establish yourself as a unique person amongst many, which is why ghost writers are often, you know, and, and artists who use them are often looked down upon, i.e. Drake, and people who copy and you know imitate other artists are also looked down upon. Um, Nevertheless, you know, we are both hip hop enthusiasts. Uh, one of us has pursued a career performing and composing hip hop songs. And I believe we share a frustration in that those who do not listen to hip hop uh, look down on it, whether they are white or non-white. Um, and I wonder, um, what do you think is the biggest uh, misunderstanding that non-hip-hop fans uh, get about hip-hop? Oh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because I love it so much, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I don't see what there is to, I get, here's the thing. There's, I'm such a music lover, period, mm -hmm. that I can find joy in almost any music and I can find value in almost any music, you know? So it's like, yeah, like top 40 pop country doesn't really do it for me. Like, I'm not like, <laughs> let's get lit and listen to uh, Keith Urban, you know? Um, but, you know, that being said, like if someone was like, I'm going to hold a gun to you, your head, like, you must tell me some country song that you love. Like, I can do it. Like Willie Nelson, I ride for Willie. Okay. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's my boy. Um, <laughs> but you know, like uh, my dad used to always laugh at me because I like sang in an Anglican church choir growing up. And like, we are not, we were not a religious family. My dad had no religious ties. My mom is grew up in communist China, <laughs> which speaks for itself, like no religious ties, period, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going every Sunday to sing in this church choir because I love the music and I love like this particular kind of like 
harmonic movement that is like indicative of the Anglican church in the 16th century, you know, like I'm such a nerd about it. So I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with these people. I wish they would open their ears up and, and discover like how wide this genre is. It is so big. There's plenty of rap music. I don't like, you know, but there's so much out there. There's for sure something that you can latch onto and love. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that's true of any, almost any genre, but hip hop, especially it's so innovative. It's so wide. It reflects such an incredibly diverse range of experiences and stories. And the sounds are so incredibly diverse. Like there's, there's no reason to not find something that you can latch onto. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, early on, we discussed how you know, Black Lives Matter, even though it was uh, born out of a uniquely American context, has uh, has uh, made its way all across the world. And I, I believe that the, you know, the worldwide phenomenon of Black Lives Matter also comes from the worldwide success of hip hop music as a whole, because, um, you know, I, I know that many people who have never met a Black person in their life in person, you know, they know of, you know, they know, of, I guess, Black people and Blackness in, mm. especially in America, through the form of hip hop. And so, uh, you know, the, it speaks to, you know, it speaks to the transcendent power of, of art as a whole. And the fact that hip hop has such a personal appeal means that people of all races, you know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be Black to, to understand how a black man living in that specific context must have felt. And Absolutely. And I think this goes back to our, our conversation earlier about like, like individualism, racialization, and where do those things interconnect in the sense of like, there's nothing more individualistic than being a rapper and getting on a microphone and telling your story. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like, especially because authenticity is like kind of one of the main like organizing uh, values of the genre. The idea that like you, you speak your story with honesty and truth onto the mic and that's your job as an MC. So what's very profound to me about that is that Yes, of course, it's about the Black experience. Yes, of course, it's about the, the cultural and social context of where each of these people come from. But it's also about the individual experience. And I think that that's what people can latch on to no matter where they come from, where it's like, yeah, I may not be a Black guy from South Bronx, but, you know, when Public Enemy talks about, I, they're totally not from the South Bronx. It was a terrible, terrible... <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound dumb anyway I may not be a black dude from the south Bronx but when this MC gets on the mic and shares their personal experience it makes me understand as a human where the similarities lie yeah and so I think that's what is very profound about um about hip hop culture and as well, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, like the idea that like, yes, we do not have to have the same racial identity to understand like there are certain situations happening in this world that are not okay. And like disenfranchised people can identify through and um, with each other. Mm -hmm. So final question, um, which artists uh, working today would you like to open for? Oh, wow. I mean, gosh, I would love to open for Carrie Fo. Um, uh, there's a rapper from New York called LaKelly47, who I would love to, to tour with. Um, and then in outside of hip hop completely, uh, it would be like a life dream to be uh, support for Little Dragon. Like if I got to be a support act on a Little Dragon tour, mm -hmm. I would like would immediately die happy. Like it, it would, that would be, that would be insane. Um, which speaks to the half rapper in me that I'm like Little Dragon's the be all end all. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Peggy Hogan, Holly, half militant, half Chinese, half rapper, 
fully authentic and fully bold human being uh, for appearing on this program. It was uh, lovely having you on and I wish you all the best with your work as a self-made woman and a an individual who's her own boss. Take care of yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs>